We came in 1958 to a pretty bucolic campus and uh, quiet um, with a dress code in effect such that women couldn't wear the form of slacks known as pedal pushers in the inner quad with impunity and they had to be in by a certain time and all that kind of thing. It was also a lily white campus, really, and uh, people didn't yet think about that the way they came to think about it quite soon as a negative feature. The student body was Republican. We were told if you wanted a lively intellectual life, you really had to go up to our neighbor in Berkeley because this place was pretty sleepy. All that was the case in 1958, but the place was also rapidly on the move. We were about to have the PACE campaign beginning a year later, in which the Ford Foundation put up a $25 million challenge grant on a three-for-one basis for the unheard of goal of $100 million. And Wally Sterling as president and pretty Fred Terman as provost were making the place better very quickly. It was becoming higher quality, it was becoming more selective, both as to students and as to faculty. It was becoming better known around the world. Um, and it was becoming gradually more engaged in the world. Wally Sterling was a most remarkable person. He was the perfect change agent for that time because he would played football in college in Canada. He knew Stanford well. Uh, he had been a Western Civ instructor, I think. And he got along with Stanford alumni. He had the capacity to communicate with the graduates of the 1930s and 40s who uh, had the money. And at the same time, he, uh, he had a strong academic bent and uh, was courageous enough to take on Fred Terman as provost, who was very strongly disciplined and quite capable of saying no to people when they tried to make mediocre appointments or failed to follow his example in improving the quality of the faculty. I don't think that Wally, or Fred for that matter, had a vision in the sense of thinking of an entirely different kind of institution from any that existed, but it was a vaulting ambition and a recognition beyond what most people had of what was possible out here. Wally pushed and pulled everybody forward, and, it, it, and forward meant more and better and more selective and more money and so on. I had been a part-time associate dean in the School of Humanities and Sciences, which meant I had some familiarity with how budgets are put together and how the appointment process works and so on. But the leap from that into being vice president provost in January of 1967 was a very big leap. And in academia, we don't tend to train people for management, so it's learning on the job very much. Troubles were beginning to take place I had been overseas on a very short sabbatical in the spring of 66 when the first sit-in took place in the president's office. It was in protest against the university's administering of an examination for the selective service system. I increasingly had responsibilities for campus order and for crisis management because the two presidents under whom I served, for quite different reasons, were not able to cope. Wally Sterling was getting on in years. He'd had an extremely serious illness a couple of years earlier and had lost a touch which he had once had with undergraduate students pretty thoroughly and had the good sense to know this and, and not get in the way as we tried to cope with these things. Uh, and then Kenneth Pitzer, poor man, came from Rice, which was a very different kind of institution uh, his office was occupied the first day he was here. He never got his feet under him, really. And I always thought he had just no appetite for combat. So he was always looking for the solution that would please everybody and square the circle. And those were days in which there were no such solutions. Whatever you did, you were going to catch it from one side or the other, if not both. I had been the first to call the police to campus when we had a riotous occupation of Encino Hall in the spring of 1969 by a smaller but much more militant group which began 
vandalizing and uh, stealing files and so on from the minute they got in the building. I spent that night, Pitzer was in Los Angeles talking to an alumni group, as luck would have it. So uh, I spent that night in conversations with a group of faculty chosen by the Senate to meet with the president under just such circumstances to share the burdens and responsibilities. And it was a wise thing to have because it meant, in contrast to some other places, the president was not left alone to decide whether to call in the police or not. So we discussed earnestly all evening, but by four in the morning, it was clear that this sit-in was different from others, that files were being rifled, that uh, there was danger to the campus planning office, uh, to the charts that told you where all the plumbing under the ground is around, around the campus, lots of opportunities for sabotage. So we concluded that we really needed to call in the San Jose Sheriff's deputies. They accepted our plan to have faculty observers go with them if they ever had to go into a building and arrest people. This being for everybody's protection, protect the demonstrators against police violence, protect the police against accusations of violence, uh, and so on. So that morning when the sheriff's deputies did come in riot gear and in sufficient numbers, uh, there were faculty with them. And in fact, the demonstrators walked out and did not wait to be arrested. And so it was completely peaceful and completely successful. We had a sharp, severe crisis with the Black Student Union immediately after the Martin Luther King assassination. And uh, they had enormous support on campus and they easily could have closed the place down had they chosen to. They didn't even threaten to do that. They didn't need to because it was obvious that they had such strong support. And we were not trying to give as little as we could. We were trying to get the job done. We were trying to play our part in breaking down barriers that had kept disadvantaged minorities essentially out of places like Stanford over the decades. So we approached it with fear and trepidation, but also with some sense of exhilaration that we were involved in a small piece of a national work that was very important to do. And I think some of that came across to some of the students. And I, while I had crises with the BSU thereafter, uh, I had a better time communicating uh, back and forth with them. There was a bomb threat to the Stanford Stadium uh, the first fall that I was president, the fall of 1970, within a month or two of my becoming president. Uh, the uh, news office got a call from journalists in San Francisco saying they'd had notice that if we would look in a certain locker in the Greyhound bus station, we would find a statement uh, which we did, which threatened to blow up Stanford Stadium if we did not postpone the game against Southern California the next day. And I had to decide in almost minutes whether to uh, defy them or whether to accede. But it was an easy decision in one sense because you knew you couldn't start giving in to that kind of thing. We decided nothing doing. We won't have anything to do with that. The police searched the stadium as best they could that night and they searched people coming into the stadium the next day. So all the ladies' handbags had been opened and so on. And then I made an announcement during the period just before the game started over the loudspeaker system and explaining what had happened and explaining why we didn't feel that we could possibly yield to such threats. Uh, and uh, this was widely acclaimed because it was what most people felt. Uh, and it, was, it went off all right. A, a few minutes after when we first scored, Nobody had bothered to tell the person who fired off the cannon every time Stanford scored that maybe today we could do without that. So the cannon went off and my wife has always said she practically jumped through the roof of the press box uh, in alarm at that point. Better yet, we beat SC and we went on to the Rose Bowl. Fundraising is the activity on which a president could spend as much time as he or she could find, there's just no limit to it because there's no limit to the amount of effort to cultivate people and interest them in giving money to the university. And we did run what was then a monumental campaign. 
it spluttered a bit in the early years because there was an economic downturn, the oil shock and so on. But in the end, it made its $300 million tar target. And uh, fundraising went on increasing and has, of course, ever since. It, the targets we reached then seemed small by today's standards, but they were big by yesterday's. We were fairly early in the business of trying to model the financial future of the institution and do budgeting in a more than uh, year by year haphazard sort of way, try to foresee what we were going to need to maintain programs that we had, uh, what we could afford to undertake in the way of innovation. I also spent some time during the latter half of my presidency working very much behind the scenes to try to restore some meaningful undergraduate requirements. Uh, the requirements had been virtually liquidated under the impact of the study of education at Stanford in the late 60s, which recommended that, in effect, faculty teach what they wanted to teach and students take what they want to take, and that's that. But I felt that there ought to be some common core and worked with the then Dean of Humanities and Sciences to create what became the infamous Western culture requirement the very last year that I was president. Everybody thinks they own a piece of the president. The alumni feel they ought to have a considerable piece of him. The faculty thinks they own him more or less completely, or should. Uh, the uh, board is always there, of course. If they're responsible, they don't try to micromanage, but that's always a temptation. Uh, and outside constituencies are a pressure too. So yes, you're pulled this way and that, and each group has difficulty understanding why you can't be more responsive to their point of view because they are not really aware of the other points of view that are tugging at you at the same time. I used to say that when I died and they opened me up and they would find Stanford Indian written across my heart the way Queen Mary Tudor said they would find Calais the last English holding on the continent of Europe that she lost written across her heart. Nothing went on afflicting me more than the decision to abolish the Indian mascot. It happened by stages. We began to take in Indian students. I mean, we began to have a program to recruit Native American students uh, in about 1972. They were very unanimous that the Indian mascot was a no-no and should go. Uh, Prince Lightfoot, the Yurok Indian who danced at football games, offended them because his dances included religious motifs from various tribes and mixed them all up together. And they thought it was sacrilegious to have that going on in halftime in a football game. The whole idea of the Indian savage noble on horseback was bad because it gave people a romanticized and misleading view of what American Indians are all about. And it allowed people to remain blissfully ignorant of the terrible conditions on reservations, the high suicide rate, the high alcoholism rate, and so on, that afflicts tribes in this country. Uh, at first, I thought doing away with the comic Indian and, and with Prince Lightfoot's dancing would be enough. But I got persuaded that we had to go the whole hog and so I did, and the student government uh, did so too. So we sort of shared the obloquy among Orange County alumni for uh, what we were doing. But you know, Gerhard Casper, years later, was still being asked questions about when he was going to restore the Indian symbol to Stanford. Nothing stuck with people longer. The university pursues truth. Uh, we know we never catch truth. Uh, the fact that truth is constantly changing and evolving, uh, that our view of things changes and evolves, even in the sciences, uh, is well known. And it causes some people to say, well, the whole idea that you're searching for truth is nonsense. You're just pursuing this or that special interest. I do not believe that to be the case. Universities must be free uh, and their faculties must be free to pursue uh, their research wherever it takes them. and. Uh, that's, that's essentially the central mission. It's very gratifying that some people say I saved Stanford. I'm aware of that statement from time to time. 
I had a lovely, touching episode with the late Moses Abramovich, uh, distinguished Abramovitz, distinguished professor of economics. And I gave him a ride into campus one day, and I made some dubious remarks about some of the buildings going up and said I wasn't sure that the architectural legacy of my years was going to be all that wonderful. And he said, Dick, you won't be remembered for the buildings that went up during your presidency. You will be remembered because you saved the university. And I, I'm more touched by that than anything just about that anybody's ever said to me. Uh, I think leadership is very contextually uh, determined. That is, the qualities that produce good leadership in one context don't necessarily do it in another. The classic case in history is being Winston Churchill, who if he had fall under a London streetcar in the mid-1930s would be a minor footnote in history. Great talents, never fully realized. And then he went on, of course, to be the prime minister everybody knows about. I had the combative qualities that Ken Pitzer did not have. Uh, I believed in universities. I believed in academic freedom. I believed in protecting them from being made into political instruments by any political force to the extent possible. I think I was realistic about the degree to which universities are inevitably politically committed in some degree. I mean, we're in favor of democracy. We're not in favor of totalitarianism. But a certain stubbornness in defense of the university and an ability to characterize the university uh, as the objective uh, and get the message across to people that that's what we were defending. We were not just defending a status quo without reason and without substance. I was really a New Englander, and I arrived here with a great set of, of expectations. And uh, for the first six months or so, uh, it was a little confusing. Uh, a, it was California, had to find a new place to live, found a bungalow in College Terrace, cost me $115 a month, <laughs> uh, and, and began to integrate myself into a, a, a biology department, which I really liked. But the excitement about Stanford was, was truly extraordinary in 1960 because all kinds of new people had come and they had real ambitions to make the place even better. And so you had the sense of entering a growth period that was really dramatic. And new guys like Cliff Grobstein and Charlie Yanofsky in biology who had come a couple of years earlier and Paul Ehrlich. And in the medical school, Josh Letterberg, Arthur Kornberg's whole department had come from Washington University uh, in St. Louis. And it was just a sense of transformation about the place. Dick Lyman saved Stanford, in effect. I mean, he took over at a time at which the kind of uh, sense of, of harmony and, and purpose at Stanford was really fractured by, by the very strong political disagreements and by the degree of violence that accompanied it on, on this campus, as much as on any campus. Uh, Dick uh, took control slowly, steadily. Uh, he was consistent. He was firm. Uh, he took an awful lot of abuse and weathered it. And by the middle of his time as, as president, Stanford was a transformed place. When I came back as provost, I had spent two and a half years in government, where when you say you want something done, it tends to get done. And I had to unlearn that and, and get a little smarter about consensus development and so forth. And I only had a year as provost, and anyone will tell you that that's not long enough to prepare for it the next thing, which in my case was moving into the president's office. I learned a lot from Dick Lyman in that year. Uh, I would have liked to have had more, but that's not the way it worked out. In 1980, as I moved across the hall and, and moved into his office, um, I had to do some thinking about what had been left out uh, 
as he accomplished the, the remarkable transformation that he did accomplish. And I sat down to write a, a speech that I gave at, at the inaugural. And uh, it seemed to me, first of all, that we had to repair a kind of imbalance between the humanities and the sciences. There was still a sense, uh, I felt, in which uh, Stanford was thought of as Stanford Tech. And uh, so I spoke about that. Uh, and uh, to be sure, during the next uh, half decade or, or decade, we, we did substantially change that picture. I'm not sure everybody recognized it, but I think we lifted the humanities a, a, a significant amount. Second was to kind of recover from the level of student-faculty disaffection that had occurred during the period of the late 60s and, and early 70s. And I thought it was terribly important to make residential education work at Stanford and to get the faculty more seriously involved with students at, at the most fundamental cultural level of, of planning community. And uh, we tried and I think succeeded in involving faculty more more deeply in that process. Third, I had, I had a real affection for the policy world because I had come out of government and I wanted Stanford to be more engaged in that and also more engaged with helping students toward public service and toward some kind of voluntary or, or community commitment. And so we started to work on that uh, in 1981 and that eventuated in the Haas Center and and the public policy piece of it was to establish a Stanford Center in Washington, which is, which is alive and doing well. And, and there's a fourth area too, and, and, and that is that during the 70s, there was lots else to do, and, and I think Stanford fell a little farther behind than it should have in terms of facilities construction. So we had to think about raising money to do that and, and finding out where the greatest needs were and, and trying to fill them. One of the stimuli surely was the, my annoyance at the kind of careerist label that people were putting on students saying they, they don't care about anything but themselves. And, and uh, I knew that there were very active volunteer groups on the campus that were doing good things. I thought it might be an improvement if we could supply a kind of surface on which community need and student urge to volunteer could crystallize and, and be more effectively put together. And, and that's what Owen House and later the, the, the Haas Center have served to do. I want to make a distinction between volunteerism and public service in the context of what you do in your community and for the surrounding community, and public service in the sense of playing a role in the political process uh, and, and in the policy uh, arena. And I wanted to encourage students to, to, to do both. Uh, that is, if you've, if you've spent a certain amount of time dealing, let's say, with the homelessness problem, you ought to be, if you're a smart kid, suddenly thinking, wait a minute, how do we, how do we fix this problem instead of having to go out and feed them uh, every, every meal? A lot of people made that happen, and I think the thing, the thing I contributed was an environment that encouraged that sort of innovation on the part of other people and eventually re rewarded it. I don't think presidents ought to take too much credit for things that happened in their administration that, that other people largely did. But what they can take credit for is creating an atmosphere in which good ideas are welcomed and in which they are not allowed to perish because the culture thinks it's good to have new things. The diversity issue was one that really presented itself and uh, it became terribly important to do something about creating opportunities for people who had not previously considered that an education at Stanford was part of their future. It's not just about race and it's not just about culture. It's really about opportunity and extending opportunity and, and broadening Stanford's own reach. And when you create diversity in a student body, uh, you are bound to create some controversy. 
On the outside, there are people who think that, uh, for example, you're making it more difficult for the kind of people who have always come here to come here. Uh, on the inside, there was certainly pressure from minority groups on campus more or less steadily during the middle part of, of the, the 1980s. South Africa and divestment was a big issue in the middle 1980s. It was a, it was a tough challenge for trustees and for the president's office and for the student body that wanted to see more done than it appeared we were doing. The whole question of cultural studies and, and special studies for minority students, particular ethnic groups or, or whatever, uh, is a contentious one. Uh, we're often misjudged by the world outside in terms of how we deal with it. Uh, I think almost everybody will remember the controversy about Western culture. There were minority students who were rather anxious to have more non-Western writers included in the uh, various tracks of, of the Western culture program. But in fact, uh, there were large numbers of faculty members who felt exactly the same way. They thought it had been a little too restrictive. And so when after half a dozen faculty meetings, there was a decision to modify the reading list, uh, actually rather marginally, we were criticized in national magazines and, and, and newspapers, uh, by, particularly by conservative commentators, as having given in to minority students. Well, uh, minority students made an argument, but it was not an argument that was uniquely theirs. And ultimately, the decision was a very thoughtful faculty decision conducted by an elected academic senate that for five meetings talked about that in preference to parking, for example. I mean, it was really a pretty good exercise of academic decision making. I think a lot of writers about, about the modern university have attempted to do away with the sense that there's real competition between research and teaching. Um, I don't really buy that. I think there is competition. I think it's resolvable. I think that the research piece of a great research university can be turned to the enormous advantage of its, of its undergraduate students. And I think that's what Stanford is now trying very seriously to do. I mean, uh, we certainly uh, secured an increase in the proportion of undergraduates who are doing, for example, independent research and senior honors theses during my time. Uh, my successors have brought that to a, a, much, a much higher level. Good for them and, and good for the idea that research can be turned to uh, the, the great advantage of undergraduate. After all, nobody wants faculty members who aren't in some sense operating at the edge of their own curiosity. On the other hand, uh, teaching is demanding, and many scholars want very much to do research, and there is at the margin competitions, but competition between those two activities, and it's up to the institution to make it clear that it's going to reward both, that it's going to treat them symmetrically, uh, not necessarily competitively, but that it's going to give serious attention to both domains of academic accomplishment. One of the things I just love about Stanford is that it is really wide open to people who want to move between silos, who, who want to engage with some other specialty, who want to start a program that involves faculty from different places. Uh, that kind of volunteer engagement is what brought the human biology program into being in the, in the late 60s. It wasn't the only one, but it was in many ways the, the most successful quickly, and so it has become a kind of poster child for interdisciplinary stuff. And what's happening now is that, uh, starting with uh, BioX, the Clark Center, uh, continuing now with Stanford's new Institute for the Environment, and presumably with an international studies venture that will, that will be forthcoming, 
uh, Stanford is committing a major part of its own academic future to problem-oriented rather than discipline-oriented studies. In other words, tell us what the problem is, and then we will find the people uh, whose heads can be put together to, to deal with it. And I think that's always been one of the great strengths of this place. And uh, it's, it's wonderful, sort of 12 years out of office, to be seeing that as a kind of hallmark for the place. The main thing I think I brought to it was uh, a great affection for the university and, and an experienced familiarity with it. Second, I loved the job. Uh, I mean, I really did. And I think people knew that I liked it a lot, that I had respect for the communities that made this place up, and that I was anxious to uh, help them both in their relationship to one another and, and in their own aspirations for success. Um, I, think, I think it was the joy of the job and my affection for the place that brought me through the, the hard places. Of course, of course our, our difficulties with the government at the end of my presidency constituted really the hardest place of all, but even in that year, uh, I, I still thought that I had a, a terrific job and was lucky to have it. I don't think presidents are a, a great shaping force. I think what they can do is to reflect the institution's own cultural values and, and speak to the outside world about its, about its qualities so that they, they can help in placing the institution into some larger, some larger context. I don't think any university, including Stanford, has successfully answered the question, what ought to be part of the common intellectual property of every educated adult human being? Uh, there are so many experiments out there about this that we're just going to have to wait a while and see which ones seem to work. Um, if you have a good faculty and you have a bunch of very curious students and you reward their intellectual curiosity, I, I think things are going to turn out pretty well. But all of us who have had the experience of, of being in academic institutions for most of their lives as students, as as graduate students, as young faculty members, and, and in all the roles I've played, I still find myself embarrassingly deficient in certain domains of, of, of human knowledge. And I hope I'm still curious enough to try to fill those gaps, but to think that we can set out a, a kind of uh, list of things that everybody ought to have, that's over specification and it won't work. And people are, who are genuinely intellectually curious are going to insist on drilling down deeply in a number of areas and that is going to cost them the opportunity to drill down in others. So what you want to keep alive is that sense of curiosity. And that's mainly what a university does for people. One of the interesting aspects, I think, if you look at the 10 Stanford presidents, and I will not uh, rehearse uh, their lives with you, but uh, nevertheless, is that they were so different, so different in their approaches. Uh, obviously, David Starr Jordan is a giant out there, and we all share with him uh, the fact that we all invoke him all the time. We always look at what did he say, and uh, so from that point of view, David Starr Jordan still exercises uh, a lot of influence. Uh, 
I, I think that is less true for some of the others, though uh, the most important modern president of Stanford, the one who pushed Stanford uh, into the first rank of universities in the world, uh, was uh, Sterling. I think Sterling's influence is felt simply in the way Stanford's culture has worked, uh, the entrepreneurship of the faculty, the innovation, the intensity with which the faculty pursue uh, their work. There is nothing relaxed about Stanford in that way. And I think to a very large extent that was of course the doing, doing of Wally Sterling and Fred Terman as provost. And uh, uh, we have a lot in common with them because we are presiding over their university. I think university presidents can still shape uh, uh, their universities. And I should not be talking about myself shaping Stanford. Uh, that is for others to say, but I can say with certainty uh, that my predecessors, uh, Dick Lyman and Don Kennedy, each shaped the university in different ways. Indeed, Dick Lyman saved uh, the universities in the late 60s and early 70s, and I think uh, we should get everlasting credit for that. At the University of Chicago, you were actually officially uh, uh, never professor. You were always Mr. or Ms. or Mrs. or whatever it was. For instance, the president of the University of Chicago, her telephone would always be, un be answered, Mrs. Gray's office, never President Gray's office. And Stanford was different. The president's office, the telephone was answered, president's office. But when you walked out, they called you Gerhard. <laughs> and uh, I just, I found it very endearing very quickly. Uh, and uh, made as much of it uh, uh, in a joking fashion as I possibly could get away with. I think one thing that distinguishes Stanford and that we should not forget, and it sounds a little bit like a cliché, but the point about clichés is they are often true, is there is really a Western spirit uh, out here. That is a spirit of entrepreneurship, there is energy, innovation, uh, and the students capture that very, very quickly. I also think there is a certain irreverence that is very much uh, reflected, let us say, in the wacky walk. The wacky walk sums up, I think, a lot about Stanford students at the very end, and not always to the approval of their parents, uh, but so be it. I was an outsider, and uh, very much so viewed as such. Chicago was viewed as conservative, and uh, clearly much of Stanford uh, did not think of itself in those terms, and bringing a Chicagoan uh, was uh, uh, viewed as uh, uh, being incredibly different and maybe out of tune with the prevailing music on uh, uh, campus. What I found most surprising, in a way, was that so much reference was made to the fact that Regina and I were of German background. In, we had lived for 26 years in Chicago and we had blend, blended into the city, we were part of the city, and hardly any references were ever made uh, to uh, uh, our ethnic background. And when I first came, the press never tired, but also lots of alumni never tired of making reference to it. They found it somewhat difficult uh, to deal with it until I uh, uh, really in a major way seized the chance given me by the Stanford motto and a kind of making uh, this background a, a virtue under the circumstances by emphasizing my ability to pronounce the Stanford uh, motto properly. The only way I could quickly establish uh, being a stand an authority on anything related to Stanford was to uh, 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 dive into Stanford history and uh, learn as much of it as possible, and indeed, if possible, learn more of it than anybody else knew. Well, that was not possible. There were always people who knew more. But nevertheless, I did a lot, and uh, it clearly helped me to establish uh, my own standing as somebody who was really trying to come to grips with uh, Stanford. By going into the Stanford history and making so much of it, in particular in, also in my inaugural speech, where I kind of, by invoking the author of Stanford's motto, 
extended Stanford's history beyond 1891 right into the Renaissance. That was quite a bold move. I added 400 years to Stanford's history. <laughs> it, was, it was a good move, I, I think. The challenge I found the hardest uh, really was what I would call multiculturalism as an ism, as a kind of ideology that put a lot of emphasis on separate identities rather than on what as a university uh, we all have in common. And uh, that of course led to some controversies later and some genuine confrontations. But uh, I found Indeed, the very frequency with which, with which multiculturalism was invoked at Stanford, something that I had to learn to live with. I was not at all opposed to diversity. Indeed, uh, Stanford's diversity, again, by comp uh, comparison with many of its competitors, is extraordinary, is stronger than anybody else's. Uh, I uh, embraced it uh, uh, with uh, a real enthusiasm. But I certainly uh, thought it was very important not to talk too much about the different identities, but instead emphasize the identity our students and faculty had in common as Stanford students and as Stanford faculty. The first two years, there were many moments when I really kind of felt down. I kind of said to myself over and over again, uh, Gerhard, you kind of have to be inner-directed. This is the jargon of a much different age from the 60s, the lonely crowd. But uh, I uh, reminded myself frequently that I had to remain focused on uh, teaching, learning, and research as the main mission of the university. But uh, there were also coincidences, and at that time, uh, a, a, a new biography of President Truman had uh, just been published by McCullough, and it gave me immense strength to read about how uh, Truman was sitting there in the White House, not loved by anybody, attacked by everybody, but doing his thing. Now, that was not my situation. I wasn't attacked by everybody, and there were lots of people who gave me support, and that was probably the case in Truman's case uh, as well. But uh, nevertheless, to read about uh, Truman's travails, and in particular read about the terrible press he was getting, uh, 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 was uh, something that that really helped me. The commission emphasized that Stanford's competitive advantage was that it could bring teaching and research together, could expose students very early to people who were at the frontier of their field and make students participate in the, in the research uh, undertaking, as it were. And uh, while that did not result in a specific recommendation, and actually couldn't, because what we later did cost a huge amount of money, and it would have been very difficult for the commission to propose something they had no idea how to finance it, uh, what we then later did built really on the intellectual climate of uh, the uh, Commission's recommendations and conclusions by uh, emphasizing Stanford introductory studies, uh, by now teaching introduction to the humanities myself, uh, by uh, uh, the university raising uh, our endowment support for Stanford introductory studies, we hope we have made the, our reforms um, secure against any future uh, financial challenges. Uh, but whether that is actually the case, I don't know. I actually kept my hand in all academic matters of the university that concern the university more generally. You know, often universities have uh, divisions of jurisdiction. The provost is, is the chief academic officer, and the president does lots of things, but uh, is less concerned with the academic uh, side of the university. I did not want that to happen, and uh, when I asked Condi to become provost, I uh, said to Condi, uh, Condi, I will really from now on treat you as my deputy.
I want to be sure that if the proverbial truck hits me, uh, that uh, you can step in immediately as acting president of the university. So there is nothing I do I will keep from you or not, uh, not inform you about. But also, I expect from you that nothing in the provost domain of any importance will be kept from me and that I will be given a chance to react. And uh, I think both of us stuck to that bargain uh, very effectively. There were really three decisions that were extremely hard, and I'm not sure I uh, know quite how to choose among them. The first was the decision to settle the indirect cost controversy with the federal government. After getting a lot of advice from trustees and uh, uh, our lawyers, I remember I was literally awake a whole night in Washington, worrying about whether the decision to settle was the right one or was the wrong one. Now, I think in retrospect, it was very clearly the right one, but you know that's only in retrospect. And it was in particular the right one because we got the federal government to say that Stanford had done no wrong and uh, that uh, these memoranda of understanding that would indirect cost recovery between the government and Stanford were actually binding obligations of the federal government. That was a tremendous accomplishment on our part, I think. The second uh, decision that was very, very difficult and that went on much kind of longer and was more excruciating was to dissolve the merger uh, with uh, UCSF. Uh, this was uh, incredibly difficult uh, for me because we had not only invested a lot of resources and uh, time and effort into uh, bringing together the uh, hospital and clinics of Stanford and UCSF, but uh, market conditions uh, were no good out here. The jungle was uh, getting to be ever worse. And in retrospect, it turns out to have been the wrong decision to merge and the right decision to dissolve the merger. But I found it very, very difficult. The third decision of this kind, uh, not viewed by anybody else as, as consequential uh, as I thought it was, was the decision uh, not to appeal uh, the trial court decision in a case called Corey against Stanford, which involved uh, free speech rights on campus and the application of a California statute to the university. And uh, while most of the issues were less real than symbolic, uh, there was one symbolic issue at stake for me that nobody else much appreciated, and that was uh, whether the university under the First Amendment had rights uh, such as its associational rights uh, that uh, we should uh, try to establish. We lost the case uh, in trial court. If you ask me which decision do I really regret, I regret the decision not to have appealed uh, uh, this case. People speculated tremendously about what a Chicagoan would do to Stanford. And of course, the uh, worry was that I might do away with football. Well, I was a coward. I didn't try to do that. Uh, uh, but uh, the Chicago influence on Stanford was really the attention I paid to uh, architecture. I was used to design competitions, which we introduced. And I was just used to thinking uh, that one can employ a content, contemporary vocabulary, as architects like to say, uh, in a traditional context. You can be both contextual and deviate from the context. This was for me always one of the most refreshing activities I was involved in because it took my mind uh, off uh, 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 all the kind of daily challenges and problems uh, and look towards something that would be, I hope, more lasting. And it's difficult to pick among buildings that one all considers kind of children in one form or another. But there are two buildings. One is actually the museum. Uh, uh, Paul Scheck did here something that uh, I uh, think has been immensely successful. He 
took the austere Athenian neoclassicistic museum building that existed and that Jane Stanford had bequeathed to us and added to it something very contemporary but also somewhat austere in its outside appearance, not altogether austere, somewhat kind of Bauhaus. And I think the way these two elements of the museum work together and have succeeded together is uh, just incredibly beautiful, never mind uh, that the Rodin Sculpture Garden adds a lot of pizzas and so on. And the other building is um, the Clark Center, uh, the BioX building that Foster designed, which I think in many ways is the most dynamic lab building in the entire country. It is uh, just a joy to go there, and I go there often. In 1996, I uh, proposed uh, uh, Stanford Introductory Studies and uh, the Stanford Graduate Fellowships. And at the end of my speech uh, to the Academic Senate, uh, to the Faculty Senate, uh, uh, they actually gave me a standing ovation. Now, I, of course, like to interpret this as their support for Stanford Introductory Studies. It may have been uh, their pleasure at my saying I would go out there and raise hundreds of millions of dollars for Stanford Graduate Fellowships and therefore indirectly for their research. But it was a combination of the two that I had thought about very hard, that I had spent a lot of time to trying to figure out, and that it worked so well, uh, I think, uh, was just a moment of tremendous satisfaction to me. Different people approach this job probably differently, and uh, I think there are more intelligent approaches to it than my approach was. For instance, you know, I'm a pretty intense person, so I tended to uh, do the job uh, eight days a week, uh, and uh, I think that's not right, probably. Would have been much wiser if I had taken more time out. And, uh, but I, I think these jobs are still doable. They are very difficult. They are more difficult than, I think, virtually any position as a CEO of a for-profit uh, corporation, a large corporation, uh, uh, because the university has so many different decision makers, and the university is basically from bottom up uh, rather than top down in any form or shape, and uh, you have to try to hold the whole thing together while also bringing about some changes. But it is doable and it is also a job which has one tremendous fringe benefit. You learn more in the job of a university president than I think in any other job available in public life, including government jobs. I think Stanford is at an interesting point in its evolution. It has built a university which is both broad and excellent across its many disciplines. And so the natural question to ask ourselves is a very simple one. What do we do to ensure that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts? That we draw from this tremendous excellence across so many disciplines uh, to see what we can do to contribute to the solution of the incredibly complex problems we have around the world, whether they be environmental, issues of human health, uh, issues of uh, development, democracy, and security around the world. I believe those are issues that the university should be able to bring its great research, teaching, communication, and scholarship uh, to, to try to make a contribution in service to the world, certainly as the Stanford's intended. At the same time, I think this will force us to rethink how we do our scholarship, how we do collaboration, to ensure that we draw from different disciplines in trying to address these kinds of complex problems. We need to ensure that the best disciplines and the best scholars can work together to solve problems which cannot be solved by one discipline or one scholar uh, working alone. That's going to require that we rethink 
a whole variety of things, how we do faculty appointments, how research is funded, how graduate students do their work, how undergraduates are involved in research. And I think when we stand back and look at the next 20 years in the evolution of research universities in the United States, it will be one that's marked by a real turning point in how we structure research and the scholarship that goes along with it and the teaching mission. BioX was really our starting point for a new set of multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary initiatives. And I think the bioengineering department characterizes what Stanford needs to do in this, in this next century. It's our first department that actually lives in two schools, in the engineering school and in the medical school. Why was that critical? Well, the mission of that department is to really focus on translating advances in the basic sciences into clinical applications in human healthcare. It has to touch faculty who are involved in clinical practice. At the same time, it touches people who are involved at the lab bench looking at the molecular structure of life and trying to understand it. And clearly, that is what engineering is. So bioengineering was the right, not only the right name for this department, but the right vision for where we needed to go. At the core of what we tried to do in undergraduate education was to reinvigorate the experience, particularly at the beginning, to get students involved in the life of the mind through freshman and sophomore seminars, through sophomore college, and to get them to think about and realize that four years is a very short time and you need to make the most of it because you only are an undergraduate once in your life. And that's why Stanford Introductory Studies, in particular our seminar programs and sophomore college, were so critical to get students exposed to great scholars, to experts in the field, to get to really know a faculty member and have that kind of transformational experience. And I think research universities across the country had neglected that. And Stanford was in a position to take a lead in reinstituting that core value that certainly, if you look back in the early days of the university, was absolutely there. I think when we look at graduate education at the university, what we've seen is a tremendous growth, both in the size of some of our programs, but certainly in the quality of our programs over the last 50 years. We now have uh, professional programs uh, that are among the best in the country, and of course, uh, a classical commitment to our PhD programs, uh, which produce some of the best researchers in the country. As we begin to think about how graduate education uh, should change and move forward, I think the first observation that everybody's made is we are one university. We should pull from the tremendous strength that we have across the university in the great professional schools as well as in the core of the institution and ask a very simple question. Are we doing the best job possible in graduate education by pulling from the entire strength of the university. What should an MBA student or a law student learn about things outside of just the narrow domain of business or law? What should an engineering student know about business or law or the international aspects of things? Increasingly, I think, we find ourselves in a world where internationalization and globalization are major forces where technology has changed uh, our, our way of life in so many different ways, um, and where our students need to have a different perspective on things as they move forward uh, through a career, uh, through a life, which may involve multiple careers and multiple challenges. I think when we look out across the world and we examine the set of challenges we face, uh, whether they be scientific challenges or challenges in economic development or international politics, the thing you immediately realize is that all of these challenges have a deeply human element. They have an element which relates to the history, culture, and traditions of, of peoples around the world. I think it's safe to say that you can't begin at the graduate level, whether it's education or research, 
to teach about those problems or to try to find solutions to them without appreciating that element. Take a simple example. Stanford will be very involved in the new area of stem cell research with Proposition 71 here in California and a strong uh, research base that we already have. We will be a leader in that area. That area inevitably brings up deep ethical questions about the nature of our existence as human beings, how we think about using new technologies to better our lives. And I think the humanities have an incredible role in ensuring that we continue to remember that technology, in the end, is only as good as its contribution to improving the human condition. When I think about my four and a half years, uh, I uh, take great pleasure in the day in which we inaugurated the Clark Center. N not only did we have a wonderful new building to celebrate, but we had the beginning of a new era at Stanford, one marked by uh, a new way of thinking about research and teaching. It is a building that has faculty from more than 20 different departments. It's not a building owned by any one department. I think that's a step towards Stanford's future and how increasingly we see organizing ourselves to respond to the changes in research and teaching. I think we've discovered as we um, built the BioX activity and the Clark Center a model which has worked very well. I like to think of it uh, perhaps as the atomic model, where you think of a physical structure like the Clark Center, an institute, uh, something of that form, as serving for the nucleus of a broad range of collaborations. Uh, in the case of BioX, there are more than 200 faculty involved. Only 40 of them sit in the Clark Center. But the Clark Center becomes the home, the nucleus of that activity, and uh, ensures that uh, the many faculty and researchers surrounding that um, think of them as a set of electrons uh, revolving around the nucleus in an electron cloud ensures that they're bound together to the, to the nucleus so that we have collaboration without having to do the impossible, which is to move all our faculty that want to collaborate with one another into the same building, which simply isn't possible given the, the vast opportunities for this kind of research going forward. When people ask me what's most unique about Stanford, and I think about the other great research universities we have in the United States and around the world, I then realize that there's one core value that we have embedded uh, in our history, in our culture, that's really made us a unique institution, and that's that we are pioneers. We are ready to embrace change, to think about new ways of doing things, uh, to constantly reinvent ourselves, not only what research we're working on, how we teach our undergraduates, how we think about graduate education, how we organize the university to promote new research directions and concepts. And I think that's an important part of what may, has made Stanford unique. We're a relatively small institution. So as a small institution, you have to do, have something that makes you unique and able to make important contributions. And I think it is that pioneering spirit that goes back to the, the Stanford's and the earliest days of the university. It's the tradition of the West. It's being on the Pacific coast um, that has made us a unique institution and something which I think we have to continue to ensure that it thrives uh, as we go forward. Probably the hardest decision uh, that we had to make was to uh, determine how to uh, adjust the university's future with respect to growth and our ability to grow on campus. Um, as many people know, we went through a very complex general use permit process. Striking a balance between allowing the university to do what it needs to do over the next one or two decades without mortgaging 
its future is a very difficult set of decisions, a very complex process. When you sit in the president's office, the first day you realize that more than 100 years ago, David Starr Jordan sat there and had to make decisions which affect our lives today. You realize that you're going to guide decisions which will affect the lives of the students who will be in this university and the faculty and the staff 100 years from now. And that requires you to think carefully about what you can do, what you need to do to support the university over the next decade or two, and how to balance those two. If there's any challenge that makes leading a university uh, quite different perhaps from the challenge of leading a corporation, say, it's the variety of different constituencies that you have uh, that the university uh, depends on and also serves whether it's students, both graduate students and undergraduates, faculty, staff, alumni, and of course the local community that surrounds us. They all have different views about what the university should do. The challenge is to ask the question of what is in the best overall interest of the university? What decision will continue to make sense 20, 30, 40, 100 years from now? To me, what's important is the core values of the institution, our commitment to research and teaching, our commitment to future generations, our commitment to operate with the highest standards of integrity and honesty, and to ensure Stanford's future for the generations that will follow. Whenever I think about a hard decision, I think about the founding grant. I think about my predecessors in the president's office and how they grappled with decisions that had comparable impact for us sitting at Stanford today. And how should I think about how they made that decision process and reflect on it and ask how we should make a decision that faces us at the current time.